Let's give our attention to our speaker, Brother Flodine. Keep your perspective in these last days. Well, it's a real pleasure to be with you, not only to see such a lovely full Kingdom Hall, but enjoy your Tucson sunshine. We left snow and ice. Some of you who are familiar with New York know what I'm talking about. But no matter where we are, no matter how much the sun shines or doesn't shine in a literal way, uh, life in these last days can be trialsome, can it? Uh, you've experienced that. We could probably go right down through the rows here and you tell me a woeful tale about what you have had or are continuing to have to deal with in these last days. And sometimes we get so tired of what we call the hassle factor of life that we may feel that another step forward, whether it's a emotionally, physically, spiritually, is almost too much to ask. Can we make it another step forward? And yet, isn't it true that we all know, most of us, we have here most Jehovah's Witnesses and some of their friends, we realize that Jehovah said in 2 Timothy 3, 1, that in these last days it would be, what, critical times hard to deal with. So we've been forewarned. Unfortunately, this is it. The last days, and so we can expect that life will be difficult, will be critical, and at times even hard to deal with. But then think about others, some who have not yet come to know about the Bible's hope, about a future a life, about how to live our lives now. Uh, they're floundering. Sometimes we feel, I can't go on. They must feel they can't go on. And so we could say, actually, we could end the talk right here and say, keep your perspective. You're in the truth. Count your blessings. We'll continue with the talk. But that is a perspective line. It's a keep balance. You're in the truth. You've got a place to go. Uh, what we want to share, though, is the fact that even God's people, ones who come to learn the truth, we know our God, we know a future hope, isn't it true that at times we can lose our perspective and we start to flounder a little bit spiritually? We could actually say to all of you Jehovah's Witnesses and friends, you're out of the woods, but you're not home just yet. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, you know, before you learned the truth of the Bible, it was like you were in a vast, eerie, dark forest. Scary things happen in the big forest. And so you may have felt, which way do I go? I'm lost out here in this world. Which way do I go in life? Uh, the foliage up above you on those century-old trees of human philosophy and theory such as evolution made it very dark down on the forest floor of Satan's old world. You may have found yourselves at times snagged on the brambles and stickers of false religious error, such as uh, hellfire, immortality of the soul, trinity, things that grew up into Christianity and have snagged people, those doctrines. Or, possibly, you became hung up on various religious holidays, maybe, that also grew up into Christianity, and they snag people and hold them back from making good progress. The underbrush of what we would call human belief has become a tangled mess over the centuries, what we call the Dark Ages, and rightly so. But consider this, too that out there in Satan's world, the eerie forest of Satan's world, the original slithering serpent Satan, the devil, is out there in his environment trying to trip you up on the coils and twisted ploys that he has available for people out there. Some in the world out there are sucked into the slimy mud holes of witchcraft, astrology, other forms of spiritism. Others they trip over deeply rooted traditions and prejudices and make no further progress. Some just disappear in the quicksand of materialism out there in the world. And then there's those unexpected things, like if you're out in the forest and this big owl just <laughs> comes flying up in your face and makes that sound, <laughs> what would you do? <laughs> Heart-rending terror. 
And that's the way life is to many people in the world. Something just flies up in their face out of nowhere, and it causes such terror. They don't know where to go. They run this way, that way. They crawl, they fall, they scramble. No sense of direction, no bearings. You may have found yourself in that situation at one time. And you've now, at that point, came to a segment of your life where you may have just finally just fallen down, maybe at the roots of one of those towering trees in Satan's world, just crying and sobbing, nowhere to go, hopeless. And just when you were about ready to give up on life, you heard some friendly voices calling to you. And they were saying, where are you? Can you hear us? Come toward our voices. We're here to help you. A search party found you. Jehovah's Witnesses called out to you out there in the world that surrounds us. They called out, said, come to us. And they led you out of Satan's forest and into the beautiful sunlight of the truth. It's like a clearing, like a meadow without the dark, scary things of Satan's world. And Jehovah, through his people, provided you with a map. A map through the wood, or through the fields, through the meadows, out of the woods, through the meadows, here's the way you can get back home. Back home to that paradise that you thought was forever lost to mankind. You have a way now. We have something to be thankful for. What a blessing. They studied the Bible with you, helped you to adjust the eyes of your heart to the bright rays of Bible truth as you came out of the dark world of Satan. It was almost blinding, the truth that you found from God's Word. Now, if you open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 and 18, the Bible uses a somewhat similar word picture when we talk about the eyes of our heart being uh, coming into this bright light of truth. And we now have a way to go, a hope ahead. And this factors into having the right perspective during these last days, a way to go. Ephesians chapter 1, did you find your place there? And if you look at uh, verse 17, Paul here mentions in his prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the, notice this, Accurate knowledge of him. Accurate knowledge. Keep that in mind, okay? And then what does it say about the eyes of our heart? It says, the eyes of your heart having been enlightened, that you may know what is the hope, a hope ahead, a hope to which he called you, what the glorious riches are which he holds as inheritance to the holy ones. So our eyes have been enlightened here in the bright meadows of truth. We have a way to go, a hope ahead. We have direction in life. However, friends, this is where most of you are. You've already been out of the woods. But isn't it true we're not home yet? We're in the meadow. How do we stay in the meadow? How do we stay in the fields getting back home to paradise without getting pulled back in to Satan's world? That is what we want to address for the majority in this audience tonight. Keep your perspective. Don't forget where you're at, where you're going. Stay in the truth. With that thought in mind, let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. You know, uh, we can't just uh, accidentally stumble into the truth and expect we're going to automatically get to paradise. It doesn't work that way. It'd be like uh, ramming around in the forest, scared to death, and all of a sudden, boom, you come out and there's a bright clearing. Huh, I made it. I'm home. You're not home. You don't know where to go yet. There's a lot of fields and meadows to go through. So we're, we came into the truth, but we can't just say, okay, it's a cinch. I made it. We could be led back into the world of Satan uh, very quickly. Look what Second Peter 3, 17 and 18 says there. It says, you, therefore, beloved ones, having this advanced knowledge, it says, here's a warning, be on your guard. Be on your guard that you may not be led away with them. Back into the evil of Satan's old world. It says, don't be led away in the error of the law-defying people and fall from your own steadfastness. Yes, we're out of the woods. We're not home yet. We've got a ways to go. How can we keep our perspective? You know, it requires, it requires concentration, a mental effort, 
to work on the faculty of our mind. Perspective is how we mentally view things. And that's what we want to talk about. How can we keep our mental powers in focus and make it back home to our front porch in paradise? How can we keep from sitting down in the pathway, in the meadow, and making no further progress to paradise? And worse yet, how can we keep from being led back into the scary forest of Satan's old world? Well, let's start off with a thought here. Jehovah's Witnesses are not perfect. Sorry to disappoint anyone. Jehovah's Witnesses are not perfect. We don't have to be perfect to dedicate our life to Jehovah. He doesn't expect that out of us yet. Some of us still struggle to combat previous wrong desires. True? Yes. Some of us still work to fight certain mental inclinations that we may have acquired in the past. We do not get rid of wrong desires or quirks of personality in a baptismal pool, do we? We come back up basically as we went down. One of Jehovah's Witnesses, but we may still have wrong desires, quirks of personality. How can we keep our perspective? Think about this. An alcoholic does not lose his craving for alcohol just because he became one of Jehovah's Witnesses. But he can fight to succumb. He can avoid succumbing to it if he keeps his perspective. Some who previously had a very adulterous lifestyle, multiple partners, or maybe a homosexual lifestyle, or maybe some severe drug addiction, those desires, cravings, inclinations do not change when they're baptized as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. But they can fight not to give in to them, and that's what's involved in keeping our perspective, staying focused on our pathway home to paradise. Turn to Galatians chapter 5. Oftentimes in Galatians chapter 5, what do you think of? You think of works of the flesh, fruits of the Spirit. That's where we always go in Galatians chapter 5. We're going to bypass those verses. We're going to read a verse before those familiar verses and a verse after them that we may not have really put together. Galatians chapter 5, when we think about uh, maybe some wrong thinking that we have, wrong desires, even though we're dedicated witnesses of Jehovah, we find our, our mind reverting back to some things, we struggle forward. This is an encouragement thought, encouraging thought from Paul in Galatians 5.16. He says, but I say, keep walking. And by the way, when we use the word walking, you know what we're talking about? We're not talking about how you put your feet on the carpet. We say walking in the Bible. Most often it's talking about how we comport ourselves, how we act, what direction we're going in life. So that's what he's saying. He says, how you comport, conduct yourself. He says, keep conducting or walking by spirit. And look what he says. And you will carry out no fleshly desire at all. Did you see that? Paul did not say you would have no fleshly desires. He said you would not carry out those fleshly desires. So even if we still struggle with some, have we made the progress where we don't carry them out? That's what Jehovah asked us, to be dedicated witnesses of his. But now let's say here, okay, so that means that as long as I don't carry them out, I'm okay. That I don't have to worry, I can still think about them and desire it. Jehovah doesn't condemn us if we have some wrong thoughts and wrong desires. He does ask us not to carry them out, but he also says, keep working on them. Uh, try to suppress them. Try to make progress. And that's what we want to talk about. How do you change a wrong desire? How do you rid yourself of it? It's easy to say that, and it comes right off the tongue very easily, but to make those changes inside is a very difficult thing. We're going to talk about how we can do that tangibly. But let's read another verse after the fruits of the Spirit. You remember the fruits of the Spirit in 22 and 23? You could probably rattle them right off for me. 
But look at verse 24 that we don't often read. And it has this word desire in it. And look what it says. Moreover, those who belong to Christ Jesus, you say you're Christians? Those who belong to Christ Jesus, it says, impaled, they deadened, they impaled the flesh together with its passions and desires. So we should try to suppress those wrong thoughts, desires from our past. Jehovah doesn't condemn us when they're still there, as long as we don't carry them out, but try to deaden them, it says. Does that sound right to everybody so far? We say, yes, it's in the Bible. It sounds right. And by, it's just logical. If you're going to keep from carrying it out, you've got to back here check the desires or the inclination. Sounds logical. But we often say, yep, yep. And we start nodding in agreement. And then we walk away and we go, how? How do you do that? How can we lessen wrong mental inclinations that we have, lessen them, suppress them, and strengthen this God-approved way of thinking and doing. The March 1st, 1993 Watchtower, it actually described this. I thought this was good. You know when we studied this a few years ago? I was looking more at the spiritual content around this. It was actually a study article uh, talking about the mental, the force actuating our mind. And then I saw, when I went back and looked at it, in those few paragraphs, it's a scientific explanation of what really happens. Once I saw that, I see how we have a tool and technique to turn it around, whether it's a wrong desire or a quirky personality. <laughs> Excuse me. I've got one, too. But here's what the Watchtower, the point it made. It said that if we repetitively take information into the brain, into the brain, that it goes from neuron to neuron, synapse to synapse, and it creates a new pattern of thinking. Now, you wonder why do some youth ditch the truth? They have this repetitive stuff coming into their brains through headphones, through TV, media. It's a way Satan uses those tools to create patterns of thinking. And when your thinking goes a certain way, so do thy, so do you. You follow it. It forms a personality. But now let's think about the other way. With that, it's a, actually an electrochemical action that uh, travels through the brain, this thinking pattern. So let's say you take the knowledge of God, that's what we talked about, the accurate knowledge of God, and you send that in. Let's say a Bible principle that you need to work on, and every day, let's say you send it into the brain. What happens? It goes neuron to neuron, synapse to synapse. It creates a new travel pattern for your brain. The old thinking pattern is still there. But it's not being as used as much. Now you're creating a new one, and so pretty soon you start defaulting to the new thinking pattern, and that becomes your normal thought, then your whole being changes. You follow that thought, your personality changes. It's a powerful thing. It's a new force actuating your mind. Now if we just read something once or occasionally, we come to a meeting and hear a great point. Oh, that was great. But we don't take it back in again and again. You didn't do anything to your thinking pattern. You're still you. You haven't changed a thing, though it was a great point. But when we take it back in, it actually says it makes an imprint on the brain. And we often use, that really impressed me. It impressed something onto the brain. That becomes a new pattern of thinking. And once we have that, then it, it becomes a new you. Your direction follows that new pattern. Your desires begin to change in harmony with that new pattern of thinking. Your behavior changes according to that new pattern of thinking. You have a new personality. That was profound to me. Then, I always think, you know, the smart people of the world, they figure a lot of things out based on Jehovah's beautiful design. But then I always say, but does the Bible support that? So let me ask, does the Bible comment on this wonderful happening, a new way of thinking, a new personality, new behavior, does the Bible actually comment on that? 
Yes, it does. Open the Bible to Ephesians chapter 4. You've read these verses before, but just let's look at it in the light of this discovery. (laughs) Ephesians chapter 4, and we're first going to identify that it is true. The behavior, the conduct of Satan's evil old world around us, it is directly linked to their brains, their mental thought patterns. Ephesians chapter 4, you see it there? Paul's addressing Christians, and he says, This therefore I say and bear witness to in the Lord, that you Christians, he's talking to, no longer go on, and there's that walking word, in other words, behavior, conduct, how you comport yourself. He says, don't continue acting, comporting yourself, walking like the nations, the world. What was the problem with the way the world comported itself? He says, for they walk, in other words, they behave, he says, in the unprofitableness of their minds. It's where their minds are at, what they've been taking in or haven't been taking in. It says they are in darkness mentally. That's the problem. They haven't been taking in the right information. The pattern of their brains is dark mentally. They're in the dark, evil old world of Satan still. They haven't come into the clearing. What does the verse say? They're alienated from the life that belongs to God because of what? It's a mental thing, because of the ignorance that is in them, and it affects their heart. It says, because the insensibility of their heart, having come to be past all moral what? It's mental. You see that word sense? All moral sense, then their conduct, their behavior is lousy. It says they gave themselves over to loose conduct, works of uncleanness, every sort of greediness. Now, let's follow this through a little bit. Is there then a way that these Christians in Ephesus and you and I can change our personalities, our behavior, our conduct? And how do we do that? If it's a mental thing, how do we do it? Let's look at verse 20. We can retrain our thinking and in the process change our behavior by learning how Jesus thought and taught and responded. Verse 20, still directed to those Christians, says... But you did not learn the Christ to be so. It's a mental thing, learning the Christ. It says, because we know Jesus didn't give himself into loose conduct. He didn't have a lack of moral sense. 21 says, provided indeed that you heard him, did you hear Jesus? And not just once or occasionally. It says what? And were taught by means of him. That's repetitive hearing. Take it in, take it in to the brains just as truth is in Jesus. And what would be the effect on our behavior, on our conduct, our very personalities? Look what the verse says. 22, noticeable improvement. It says that you should put away, and look what it's talking about, the effect The old personality, where did that thing come from? It's based on how we were raised, who our parents were, who we went to school with, what we saw on TV. It forms a personality. Most of us don't like the thing that we find we have, and we begin to want to make corrections. We didn't get it on purpose. We kind of default to this thing called our personality. But it says, put away the old personality. Why? It conforms to, sure enough, This learned behavior, as they call it secularly, conforms to your former course of conduct, which is being corrupted according to his deceptive desires. But that you Christians, it says, should be made new in the force actuating your mind. Mind. Brains. Now, what is this new force that actuates our mind? Holy Spirit wrong. It's not talking about the Holy Spirit here. You know what that 93 Watchtower said? It says this new force is our own mental tendency and inclination. The old force was our old mental tendency and inclination. Now this new force, it's a new thought pattern that's been formed by, what did verse 20 say? By learning the Christ, by taking in principles of God's Word. 
where we learn the Christ, we learn God's will, we're taught by him, this new pattern, a new force begins to exercise in our mind. And verse 24 says, it affects your personality, it says, and should put on the new personality which was created. This time your personality is not happening by accident. It's by purposeful design in harmony with God's will. And that's what it says, which was created according to God's will in true righteousness and loyalty. Now, isn't that beautiful? You see, there's a process. There's a tool, a technique to change who we are by taking in certain principles from God's word, repetitively making a new pattern of thinking. That's why John 17, 3 says, taking in knowledge of God leads to everlasting life. Why is that? It's good stuff going in. New patterns are formed. Your behavior changes in harmony with God's will. He says, welcome to everlasting life. Well, what will you do now that you have officially come out of the woods into the clearing of the truth? What we want to say first off, friends, enjoy it. We've got an evil world around us, yes, and Satan's throwing sticks out of the woods at us in the clearing here, but enjoy being in the clearing. There's sunshine, there's flowers, there's blue skies. Some of us are so painfully hit by what we experience in Satan's old world, we come running into the meadow and we're still on a med dash, running, running to paradise. Stop. Enjoy it. Make some changes. We're not home yet. We can make some adjustments and keep our perspective in these last days. We can say this, too, to be realistic. If we're not careful, we could stumble. Right here in the truth, in the clearing, there are occasional branches that fall from some of the trees in the clearing. If we're not mindful, we could stumble right here in the truth and fall down. But isn't it true, don't you agree, that being out of Satan's world, out of the woods, and in the truth is such a reassuring thing? Because now we know there's a way to go. We're not lost anymore. We've got a path to follow, home to paradise. we found the truth. Keep that mental picture of where you are where you're going, enjoy living as a witness of Jehovah, tantalize yourself with the joy, the joy of peaceful bliss yet ahead on your front porch in paradise. Think about it. Dream about it. Keep it in focus. That's keeping our perspective and not being distracted by Satan's world. Jesus said a, just an excellent example in this regard. If you turn to the Hebrews chapter 12, we're going to read the first three verses. And Jesus looked down the path. He envisioned home on his front porch, the throne of God. And he made it. And remember, friends, that here in the truth, in the meadow, we're surrounded by a global brotherhood. They're like beautiful flowers populating the meadow of truth. Stop. Look at some of the flowers around you in your congregation. Look at their good points, not at their wilted petal. But look at all the bright petals they have. Enjoy them. We often look at the imperfections of our brothers. He's got a wilted leaf. You know, but look at the beautiful flower. Do you know where he came from? He was transplanted from that evil old world. Stop and smell the imperfect but precious brotherhood. And that's what it says here in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. It says, So then... Because we have such a great bouquet of flowers, no, it doesn't say that, does it? It says, because we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us put off every weight and stay out of the brambles too, it says, and the sin that easily entangles us. And let us run, run with endurance the race that's set before us as we look intently at the model at Jesus Christ. It says, look intently at the chief agent, perfecter of our faith, Jesus. And what helped him to enjoy his journey home, even though he had some sticks thrown at him from Satan's evil world? How did he get there safe on his front porch? Look what it says there. 
for the joy that was set before him down the path. He endured a torture stake. He kept his perspective, despising shame, and he made it home. It says he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Then it says again, indeed, consider closely the one who has endured such contrary talk by sinners against their own interests. And what would be the results if we contemplated our Lord Christ Jesus and how he made it home? Look what the verse says. That you may not get tired and give out in your souls. Anybody tired in these last days? Yes, I sure was. I drug myself in here. Look at the Christ. How did he focus? What did he think about? Where was he at? You're in the meadows of truth. You've got a way home. It reinvigorates us so we won't get tired out. As we wind our way to God's new world, don't lose perspective. Satan's calling out from the dark shadows of his world, and by some means of temptation, he thinks he's going to get you back. By some discouraging factor, I will get you back. By some disappointment in yourself or someone else, I will have you back. You're in the meadows. You do not have to go. Stay on the path home. We come out of the woods, and this is a beautiful thing when I think about it. Millions of people from every culture background talk about twisted and torqued lives. They learn the truth. And they begin to make those big changes in their life to accommodate Jehovah's righteous standards. It's an unbelievable thing. Major changes in their personalities to accommodate Jehovah's high moral standards. The vast majority of Jehovah's Witnesses stay clean morally year after year. But there are some who do not. They give in to those desires. They don't create that new pattern of thinking. And they carry out the wrong desire. Jehovah's so loving, he says, okay, well, how do you feel about that? Well, I, didn't mean to do, I don't want to ever do it again. You can stay in the meadow. But there's some who say, I could care less. I'm having a great time. They have to be disfellowshipped from God's uh, congregation so they don't contaminate. And sometimes we hear the figure, and it's like a mule kicking us in the chest, an impact. You've heard figures, sometimes 40,000 a year have been disfellowshipped, most of them because they were unrepentant for gross moral wrongdoing. Now, how does that figure hit you? Because I'm going to use it to illustrate what the, this word perspective means. You know what perspective is? Perspective is explained to be the ability to look at circumstances and statistics in their true relationship with the bigger picture. Okay, let's talk about the 40,000 a year that occasionally we hear about have been disfellowshipped. First, it's unnerving. Oh, I can't believe it. 40,000, can you believe that? And we say, Jehovah, what are you doing? What's happening here? And we start to get panicky. Anxiety starts mounting. You know, maybe Satan's winning in his efforts to destroy God's people. We're falling apart. But before you mentally or emotionally overreact to the 40,000 figure, Here's what perspective is. It's putting it in its true relation with other facts and statistics. Let me explain. Consider this. There are over 80,000 congregations of Jehovah's people worldwide. So even if 40,000 were disfellowshipped in a given year, that's a half a person per congregation per year. It's only one person out of two congregations a year that ends up getting disfellowshipped. That hor horrifying figure now is like, oh, oh. See, that's perspective. When you start putting things, and don't just overreact the first thing that flies up in your face like that large owl in the forest, but you stop and think, what else do I have to consider? That's perspective. And then when you think another statistic, that a statistic is basically true, right on through, every year, half of the number that are disfellowshipped, half of that is reinstated every year. So that means the net loss is 20,000 a year, if you use the 40,000 figure. And now that means that only one person, net loss is one person in four congregations in a whole year, in effect, have left the truth, been disfellowshipped.
So I, I just thought that would be a good way to see that uh, sometimes we can overreact to the first thing we get, whether it's a problem in life, but then you start to stop and weigh it in relationship to paradise, where we're going, and you can bring that thing down to its real size and deal with it. It's commendable by those statistics that most of God's people then continue, despite a declining moral world, they continue to maintain Jehovah's high standards, and we commend our brothers and sisters for that. But we want to take this matter of keeping our perspective just a little further than that, not just out of Satan's world and uh, not committing immorality. We want to go some steps beyond on keeping our mental perspective. There is what we call the Christian personality. Ephesians called it the new personality. How have we done in that regard? Why is it that some of us continue to drag around some of these things we called quirks of personality? You know, why don't we just change them? If they're quirks and we know they're quirks and everybody else knows they're quirks, why don't we just get rid of the thing? It's because most of us are totally oblivious to the fact that we've got the quirk. You, know, you probably know something about me if you knew me uh, like my wife knows me. You would know what my quirks are. Why don't we get rid of that thing? Well, we want to talk about how can we and will we make progress, because sometimes our quirks can be very uh, problematic to others. But what happens is that, uh, let's say you're coming to the Kingdom Hall tonight, you're all dressed up, you look beautiful, by the way, and you're coming to the Kingdom Hall without realizing it, you ran your hand down this uh, dirty handrail, and you got soot, dirt, on your finger. As you're coming in the door, you didn't notice this, but you... <laughs> you touched your nose with this dirty finger. You're oblivious to it, you know? So you walk in, and if you don't walk past a mirror, or if someone doesn't tell you about it, you could just keep right mixing with everyone, smiling sweetly, hello, how are you, brother? And they're all looking at you. Why don't you get rid of that thing? You don't know you have it. That's the way it is with our personalities. Sometimes we have a little soot. We're okay, most of our personality is clean, we dress it up, we look good, but there's this one little piece of it that is a flaw that everybody can see but us. What do we do? How do we deal with that? Let me just, uh, first of all, just rattle off some of these personality things that you may have or you notice in someone else. One person may be too judgmental. It's good to be a person of justice, but we may be too judgmental, and we're starting to judge not what persons do, but why they do it. It's very irritating. If you got the quirk, get rid of it. Another one, though, may be a little differently, very lenient, and he lets everything slide by him. He never addresses any problems. That's no good either. Another person might be extremely negative. Everything's wrong, nothing's right, always complaining. You like to be around that kind of a person? No, they got soot on their nose. It's a problem. How are they going to know about this? They don't know. They're oblivious. They think that they're just pretty bright. Uh, someone else thinks he's always right, extremely proud. That's a problem personality. There's ever so many of these quirks, and we, without realizing it, continue to blunder through life with this quirk that everybody else knows but us. Well, how can we deal with it? Turn with me to James 1.22, because we said, with that soot on your nose, that you may not know about it and you go right along with life until you look in a mirror. Let's see how James uses the mirror illustration, how beautifully it fits this situation we're going to talk about now. James 1.22 and 25, through 25, it says, everybody get there. <clears throat> you can read fast and catch up with me. It says, however, this is James 1.22, however become doers of the word, that's the word of God, and not hearers only. What's the problem? It says you could be deceiving yourself. You think everything's wonderful, 
It says you could be deceiving yourselves with false reasoning. 23 says, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, this one is like a man looking at his natural face in a mirror. He looks at himself, off he goes, immediately forgets what sort of man he is. Now, can you imagine with that soot on your nose looking in a mirror? Oh, boy, got a little something there. Oh, well. And you take off out of the kingdom hall and don't do anything about it? He says, that's, that's ridiculous. So now, what is the mirror, though? Because that's what we need to do is say, well, I need to look at something. I, I'm wondering what my nose looks like right now. What's my personality like? Now look what it says. 24, it says, well, we already read that one. Let's look at verse 25. It says, but... He who peers into the mirror of God's word, it says, peers into the perfect law that belongs to freedom and who persists in it. He looks closely, repetitively taking it into his brain, this word of God, reflecting his personality into the word of God. It says, this man, because he's become not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, will be happy in his doing it. We're going to take the opportunity to peer into the mirror of God's word a little bit and for some of you, it may be the first time you really realized that uh, there is a way to check my personality out and then to reflect something more than what I have been. We're going to identify what I call a reshaping tool. And if we get it and continually mentally take it in, you will be one of the most beautiful persons in your congregation. You'll be a flower without wilted petals. Everyone will love you. They'll be drawn to you. Well, what is this? Let's turn to our primary scripture, and you've read it before, but I'm going to ask you to read it again. 1 Peter 2, 21. Imagine you have Jesus Christ in your congregation. Everybody would love him. He'd be like a magnet. Everybody would be flocking around Jesus and... He would never do anyone any harm. You can be, not quite, but you can be similar to Christ Jesus. How? 1 Peter 2.21 says, In fact, to this course, so it's a way of life, this course you were called because even Christ suffered for you. Now, it's interesting that it says Christ suffered. So in the context of him being a model, it's talking about when things aren't going well. You know, if everything was going well, it's quite easy to be like Christ, isn't it? Everything's going my way. Yes, how are you? I'm like Christ. But when it's negative, when it's negative, what happens? When we have some problem, some thorny thing, now is the real test of being like Christ, isn't it? And that's what it says, the Christ suffered. I thought that interesting. Suffered for you, leaving you a model when suffering for you to follow his steps closely is basically what it's saying when things aren't going well. 22, you cannot accommodate, just kind of flags it. He committed no sin, nor except you found his mouth. So we can't do it just like Jesus, but he's a model, a pattern. And 23 says, when he was being reviled, he did not go reviling in return. When he was suffering, he didn't go threatening. No, that's the way I always work. You've got a problem, you've got a flaw. You got that from somewhere. Maybe it's the way your parents reacted, or your grandparents, or somebody. If you are a threatener or a screamer or a reviler and returner, then you're flawed. It's not like Christ. What did Jesus do when he received even abusive treatment? And maybe it's something that we can't really control. Someone's beating us up emotionally or verbally or some other way. Don't let their flaw, their behavior, create a flaw in you. What did Jesus do? It says he kept on committing himself to the one who judges righteously. Jehovah will judge that situation accurately, everlastingly. Don't allow it to bring out a flaw in you where you become a screamer in return, a reviler in return. You see, this is a model. Try to follow his steps closely. Well, some might say, boy, I'm doing pretty good then because I've been a Christian for a number of years and I don't do that. I don't threaten or revile in return, I'm doing pretty good. You know, if, if a, a non-believer says something harsh to me in the ministry, I say, have a good day. I'm just like Christ. Or if a member of my family or a member of the congregation, due to their flaws, hurts me, damages me, I don't go threaten in return. 
You know, well, I found the best thing for me is I just don't talk to them. Doesn't sound like Christ, does it? You know, so we take this so far, don't revile and return, but then we shut up. You know, well, I found the best thing when that brother walks in the hall, I don't revile and return. He walks down that aisle, I go to that aisle. That, <laughs> that hit home with someone. <laughs> But can you see the point that we could think we're doing pretty good as Christians? Reality, the boat is to following the model's example. Let's take a little bit further. Look at chapter three. We're just going to look at the first three words, just to show we're still talking about this model, Christ Jesus. Chapter three, verse one says, "In like manner." So that means like the model, Christ Jesus. You wives deal with your husbands. So how would Jesus interact with his head? That's now a model for you to interact with your husband. Look at verse 7. It says, you husbands continue going in like manner. That's like Christ Jesus with your wife. So how did Jesus treat the congregation? He was never abusive, never harsh. He considered them. He led them. That's how you should treat a wife. But now let's look on verses 8 and 9. It says, finally, all of you be like my learn not to do that, or reviling for reviling, not me, I walk down the other side of the aisle, but then here's where we stop. And most Christians, even in the truth, in the meadow, have not grasped the reshaping tool of personality, the extent to which Christ intended and our God wants. It says, let's finish the verse. It says, not paying back injury for injury, reviling for reviling, but to the contrary, woe, bestowing a blessing. Because you were called to this course. That's the same word in uh, chapter 2, verse 21, this way of life. So that you may inherit a blessing. This is saying that if you're injured by someone, reviled, don't just shut up, walk down the other aisle. It says, send out a positive signal to that person. Bestow a blessing and you'll get a blessing in return. That is where we have difficulty. But if we want to be Christ-like, if we want to grow to a beautiful person that everybody admires, respects, and loves in this congregation, we have to work on the last part of verse 9. Bestow a blessing. You say, ooh, this is getting serious now. Um, you mean I've got to talk to him? Kindly? Yes, bestow a blessing, it says. Don't react to things. React sounds like it's going from our flawed personality traits. Rather, we say respond like Christ. Learn the Christ. Well, let me ask you this. Does it work? Let's ask this. Did Jesus ever have to do that? Somebody hurt Jesus, and he not only didn't revile them back or injure them back, but he sent a positive signal, a blessing, and then he inherited a blessing. Did Jesus ever have to do that? There's many, many times. I'm just going to run through one quick. You don't even have to turn there in the Bible. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, he had promised Peter, Peter, you're going to get the privilege and responsibility of the keys of the kingdom. You're the one that's going to open up to Jews, Samaritans, and Gentiles the hope of heavenly life. What a privilege. And just a short time after that, though, on the night Jesus was to die, he'd already been be betrayed by one of his apostles, Judas. And now he's being interrogated, and in the courtyard below is Peter, who denied the Christ three times. The account in Luke indicates that Jesus must have been on a balcony or a terrace, at least for the last denial by Peter. He heard his last blaring denial of Christ. I do not know the man. At one of the most intense moments of Jesus' human life, he hears somebody he bled for deny him. That's injury. Jesus took it. Now, 
what would Jesus do? Well, I'm not going to injure him back. So he didn't injure Peter back. He didn't say, well, I disown you too. That wasn't like our Christ. But then he sent out a blessing. Just 50 days later, he allowed Peter to use the first key of the kingdom. He didn't say, well, Peter, just for that, no keys of the kingdom to you. No, Jesus bestowed a blessing. He realized the man is a flawed, imperfect human. He's not fully responsible for everything he says and does. He should never have said that, but he bestowed a blessing. And he allowed Peter to open up on Pentecost the opportunity for Jews to now have the heavenly hope. He bestowed a blessing. What blessing did Jesus get back from that positive thing? Peter gave his life and his soul for Christ Jesus after that, for his God. He gave his entire life serving. What a blessing that was in return to Jesus. There's example after example that we could use like that. But does it happen in the congregation today? I mean, what if? What if someone hurt me, you? What if you sent a blessing back to them? Would it work? I'm going to give you an experience that really did work, that I became familiar with. A brother called a fellow believer, a fellow witness on the telephone to ask about a computer problem he was experiencing. The brother he called had tremendous expertise in the computer field, so he thought, having a problem, I'll call my brother. So he called the brother. Uh, the brother on the other end got a little irritated, uh, frustrated. Maybe he had been felt hassled. But he came across very brusque, abrupt, even rude to the brother that called him. Well, the brother who called him was disappointed. He was upset. There's no need for him to treat me that way. Even if he was busy, he didn't have to treat me that way. And so he was talking to me about this. And so right away, I've been preaching, you know, Jesus, you know, bestow a blessing. So he said, I don't even want to talk to him again. I think, well, that doesn't match, First Peter 3, 9. He's not going to revile. I asked him, I said, how did you handle it? He said, well, I was polite, you know, hung up. He said goodbye and hung up. I said, well, what I've been coming to sense is that there's this other part of verse 9 that most Christians don't exercise. So I read in First Peter 3, 9. It says, don't revile and return. He said, I didn't. Look at verse 9. It says, bestow a blessing. And you'll get a blessing in return. This is a mature brother. And he looked puzzled. A blessing? What do you mean? He didn't know. He'd looked in the mirror, the perfect law of God, and didn't know how to wipe the soot off his nose. So we talked about the possibilities, how he might be able to deal with this. You know what he did? That day, this happened in the morning. He talked to me around noon. That afternoon, he called the brother back. And he said, uh, brother, he identified who he was again. He said, I just wanted to apologize. He said, I realize I must have caught you at a very bad time. I could just tell it was probably a little frustrating to you. And I just wanted to apologize. I hope I didn't start your day off wrong. That was a blessing. Instead of saying, why did you talk to me that way? This is the way he did. I apologize. I probably caught you wrong. I hope I didn't disturb your day. He said, the bro later he told me, the brother on the other end melted down. And he was stumbling over himself. No, brother, I apologize to you. I was so embarrassed the way I came across you. Oh, please, any time you have any computer problem, do call me. I'll be glad to help you. I'll get somebody else to help you. And he would do that. You see, he sent a blessing when injured, and a blessing came back. His computer works wonderful. A blessing came back. <laughs> but I think we get the point. I think we get the point of how this can work. It's a way to make our person, no matter what the other person does or doesn't, and even if they don't respond well, you are answering to your God for your Christ-like personality, not for the other person. He may not have this awareness yet that he's supposed to really be like Christ, but you have a responsibility. And if we all did that, what a beautiful, warm, loving, wonderful place it would be all the time. I'm going to show you something here on the cart. Or what is it? A chart. I'm imperfect too. 
Um, it's not quite as big as I want, but I'm going to try to make it work. I'm not sure if this one works, but we'll try it. See that? And that? This line represents... I wanted to save my red one for later, but we'll use it now. Jesus' personality. Okay? That's Jesus' personality, stable, like a rock. This one here is what we'll call human, human emotion. And uh, as long as we or the other person act like Christ, it's a beautiful thing. Straight line, wonderful. Or as long as we keep our emotions in control, straight line, it's a beautiful thing. There's never a conflict between these two lines. Uh, this Christian zing along with Christ's personality, word zing along with calm emotion, or it could be either way. We could be up here, there, down there. But here's what happens, is we're all humans, so we have emotion. It's okay, have emotion. And so it starts spiking up off of that line. And then we maybe get a little more excited about something, it goes up a little higher, and then we contain ourselves, we're doing pretty good, and then another thing happens and we go up on the line. That's okay. We still haven't conflicted with our brother. Or they haven't conflicted with us, depending on which line we're representing. Now, even when we spike up considerably like this, as long as... See, nobody can keep Jesus' personality perfectly, so we always dip below the line of Jesus' personality. It happens. We're human. And so we dip down maybe really below Jesus' line. But there's no conflict because our brother was controlling his emotion at the time. But now what happens sometimes, let's just suppose we dip down. Uh, boy, that was close. We missed. <laughs> but as long as, even when our emotion spikes a little bit, if the brother at that moment handled it like Christ, there's no conflict or vice versa. Here's what happens so, sometimes, though. We spike up with our emotion, and he doesn't handle it like Christ, and we have shrapnel. You see the point? As long as we, even if our brother's emotions come up and down, if we develop the personality of Christ, we can deal with it. We can handle it. We can understand he's imperfect. He's going to make his mistakes. And we don't have a conflict or vice versa. He handles it like Christ. When we spike up, it's okay. It's when this happens, where our emotions go up and somebody doesn't handle it like Christ, there's conflict in the congregation. The peace is disturbed. Brothers have to get involved. People start walking down opposite aisles. That type of thing happens. So we want to just make a powerful point because we, can, we know doctrine. We know the truth. We know the hope ahead. Sometimes the thing that causes us to begin to falter spiritually is when we start having these little personality things that begin to grow in a congregation. That's where a lot of damage can occur. It doesn't have to happen if we would send in, like Christ, instead of reacting, respond, how would Jesus handle this? I'm going to give you just another example. And it's in Mark chapter 5. And I might just mention that the situation is different, but we want to look at the way Jesus handled it. Uh, he's the model, follow his steps closely. Now, what I was thinking about is sometimes our brothers and sisters, they don't handle things well. Maybe they even have a severe emotional disorder. Maybe they uh, were beat up in their past, it's created some emotional turmoil, and the dear person is just trying to get to paradise, but like a person with been damaged physically, there might be a little limp there, but you notice it, how do you deal with that? Do you avoid the person because they have some uniqueness there? Or maybe it's a chemical imbalance of the brain. They can't help it, and they just act or react what you would view as different, odd. How do you deal with that? How would Jesus deal with that person? You know the compassion, the tenderness that Jesus had. He would reach out to that person. And that's what we're going to look at here in Mark chapter 5. The circumstance is very different, but you can see Jesus' spirit. In Mark chapter 5, this is the person, in this case, the person's problem was he had an unclean spirit. We're not talking about that. Just when something 
uh, it doesn't go well with another person. Maybe their behavior is a little abnormal, some aberration of personality. How do you handle it like Christ? This man, just to see his behavior, Jesus gets off the boat there in the first verse of chapter 5. And verse 2 talks about the man with the unclean spirit. But verse 3 says he lived among the tombs. Nobody could bind him. He had super strength. Uh, look at the end of verse 5. He uh, self-mutilating. He's slashing himself with stones. But uh, Jesus deals with him. Jesus, instead of looking him at a, as a sheep causing trouble, Jesus said, this is a sheep in trouble. What a beautiful way to look at any of our brothers and sisters if they're struggling with something beyond their control. What Jesus did in this case is he was able to remove the problem and send it over the precipice. We don't have the miraculous power of Jesus to relieve our brothers and sisters, maybe undo stress, emotion that they have. But can we look at them like Christ? Can we look at them as a sheep in trouble, not a sheep causing trouble? What happened in this case? Well, if you look at verse 15, you know, he was sound in mind after Jesus relieved him of the the, uh, stress that he was dealing with. But look at verse 18. This man who had been demon-possessed in this case began entreating him, entreating Jesus, that he might continue with him. He said, I want to come with you. I want to preach with you, Jesus. He was a trapped sheep. Jesus released a trapped sheep, and he wanted to go preaching with Jesus. Jesus says, no, you should go to your home territory, tell your relatives about it. So look at verse 20. It says, and he went away and started to proclaim in the Decapolis, all the things Jesus did for him, all the people began to wonder. This was a dear person that was trapped with a heavy burden. But what we want to see, how did Jesus handle it? Jesus reached out to him. Jesus helped relieve it. Oftentimes, if uh, there's somebody that has a unique personality or they're struggling with something, just reach out to that one. Many times people will find some reason to walk to the other side of the hall. Walk up to that person say how lovely it is to have you here. Jehovah loves your heart. Jehovah loves who you are at heart. Good to see you still here. You're an integrity keeper. That Christ-like spirit helps that person. They feel a part of. They're warmed to the congregation. They feel they can be safe here in the meadow with the flowers around them. The truth does allow us to smell the roses along the way, despite the troubled conditions of these last days. Uh, Jesus said that we could expect anxiety. He said sufficient for each day is its own anxiety. So how can the truth help us? Anxiety is a state of mind. Anxiety is not the circumstance. It's our mental perception of the circumstances. That's in... Webster's dictionaries and medical dictionaries, anxiety is a condition of the mind. It's how we react to the events. So how can the truth help us? It does not erase all anxiety in these last days. We're not home to paradise yet. We're still surrounded by Satan's evil world. But just knowing that there's an all-wise, all-powerful creator who sees what's going on and can correct it, will correct it at the right time, not just to solve our pain, but to solve our pain and answer issues above the clouds about integrity, about universal sovereignty. Just knowing that and putting that message into our mind helps us to deal with undue anxiety. It helps to bring the spikes down where we can manage in life. Turn to Philippians 4, and this is a scripture, again, you've read before, but when we read it this time, let's feel it. Philippians chapter 4, when you're experiencing anxiety, and we all do, more or less, depending on circumstances and where we're at, be determined to appeal to your God. You know the truth. And you know that any trial that you are experiencing is only temporary. It is temporary. Jehovah can and will adjust things. We have everlasting blessings ahead. You're going home. It's going to be okay. No matter what anxiety you face, it's going to be okay. Let's now read Philippians 4, 6, and 7. 
It says, do not be anxious over anything. Well, we know what that means in context is not unduly anxious, because Jesus already said sufficient for each day is its own anxiety. We're going to have some. But not anxiety to the point of eclipsing spirituality. If anxiety has begun to cause us to falter spiritually, it's too high on the charts. And so it says, don't be that anxious. But in everything by prayer and supplication, along with thanksgiving, let your petitions be made known to God. It says, and the peace of God that excels all thought. It doesn't say gets rid of all thoughts. It doesn't say changes all thoughts. It says it excels, it supersedes all thoughts, no matter what your wild thoughts are. The peace of God, you've got a hope ahead. You've got a front porch in paradise. It's going to be okay. It excels all thought. It says that, my friends, it says will guard your hearts and your mental powers by means of Christ Jesus. The high panicky level of anxiety can be significantly reduced when we keep our problems, our pain, our thoughts, our emotions in their true relationship with the bigger picture. What else is happening? Where are we going? It makes a difference no matter how those trials are. Remember that there's bigger issues above the clouds right now that Jehovah is dealing with. And part of those issues is being an integrity keeper now despite what circumstances Satan tries to capitalize on. I'll give you a quick example. Sister in our congregation, faithful sister, lovely person, unbelieving husband, two children, she works full-time to support. Often, almost every other month, she'd be auxiliary pioneering, raising children, doing full-time work. How did she do that? But the last seven years have been very difficult for our sister. She's had tremendous emotional upheaval due to some past circumstances, how she was treated. So she's been dealing with it. She's still a faithful sister, but she has heavy bouts of depression and even feeling suicidal. So recently her son got into a very serious trouble, was actually put in prison, it was distraught. She wasn't at the meeting one day. So an elder called her right after the meeting, said, we missed you, how are you doing? And she said, well, I'm glad you called me today. She said, actually, I was just going to commit suicide. And she's had this feeling off and on, but she's been able to manage it, very good sister. She said, I was just going to commit suicide. I was going to do it today. And so the brother said, well, who have you been talking to about this? And She said, well, I've been talking to the person that helps me secularly and one sister that I talk to a lot. And the sister told me, don't do it because Jehovah doesn't like that. And you might not be in paradise. She said, but I don't really care about paradise. She said, I'll be asleep. I won't know whether I'm in paradise or not. I think I'll just do it and be out of my pain. Well, the brother remembered Job the integrity keeper. And we don't call Job the basket case, do we? We call him the integrity keeper because he went through tremendous circumstances, traumatic circumstances. He said in Job 6, 2, and 3, my vexation, my emotion is heavier than the sands of the sea. That is why my own words became wild talk. Job said that. He had wild talk. In Job 10, 1, he said, I have a loathing for life. Earlier, he said, the graveyard is for me. He said in chapter 3, I wish my mother had a miscarriage and I was never born. The man had tremendous emotional agony due to the traumatic circumstances he experienced. He had this want-to-die feeling. So the brother remembered that. He shared it quickly with her and he said, you know, I've known you for a number of years. You love your God in your heart. It's so obvious you love Jehovah. He said, I cannot see you putting a smile on Satan's face by ending your life today. I can't see you giving Satan that kind of glory. He said, no, I hate Satan. And brother said, well, I'm sure today you'll go down on Jehovah's side of the ledger as an integrity keeper. You won't do something to make your God sad and Satan glad. And she said, well, thank you, brother. That's what I needed to hear today. Just be an integrity keeper. 
So the brother said, well, uh, my wife and I are going to come over. We're going to come over and just give you some support. She said, you don't have to now. I'm doing fine. That's all I needed. See, it was a perspective getter. It's getting the painful circumstances in perspective with bigger issues, larger picture. He said, no, I will come over. No, don't. I'm doing fine now. That's all I needed. It was a five-minute phone conversation. So the brother called her the next day. She said, he said, how are you doing? I'm doing great. That's all I needed. A week later at the meeting, she approached the brother and said, never forget that line. Somebody else is going to need it. And I said, do you need it? She said, no, I'm fine. You see the power of perspective. It helps take high spikes of emotion, bring them down to emotion, but manageable. It's thinking things out. And when we deal with each other, practice, practice, practice being more like Jesus. Thank God for your blessings. You're not home yet, friends, but you're out of the woods. You're in the truth. What a beautiful thing. Don't let Satan dissuade you with his tricks and sticks from the old world out there. At 3 John, verse 4, the Apostle John said, No greater cause for thankfulness do I have than these things, that I should hear of my children go on walking in the clearing, in the meadow. John says, go on walking in the truth following Jehovah's way through the meadows, the fields, out of the darkness of an evil old world. It's a pleasure being with, here, with you this weekend. We look forward to tomorrow as well. But we really, really look forward to seeing you back home on your front porch in paradise.